This man deserves it. So please, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Jeff Helgeson. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for having me here. Um, there are three books, and they are available at the round table over there. Um, and uh, the first is called Sign of the Times. I'm going to read them in a rather interspersed order, we shall say, um, in that I'm going to begin with Sign of the Times, move briefly to Fall from Grace, come back to Sign of the Times, and then end with uh, cutting from um, the longer prose piece, Thresholds. And you'll understand immediately why I chose this as the first passage. This is the beginning of nothing here in this place now. Gather expectantly together nothing and it's stuck. A place in time with no end in sight, signifying all that such a beginning, such a circumstance is able to convey. Um, Dave Getchick, who is the publisher of the, all three of these works, really, um, has subtitled Sign of the Times, a non-narrative postmodern verse play and pastiche. Mm. Not sure what that means, but... Yeah. Well, there's always that. So I passed uh, the manuscript of this by a friend and colleague at DePaul University, William McNeil, who's the author of Heidegger and Ethos and the Gaze of the Eye and the End of Theory. And Will's comment about the piece was that it's really not about nothing, or not absolutely nothing, uh, but rather it's a piece about nothing as it permeates and surrounds every something, a nothing, that is at the uh, heart of time itself. And uh, with those inspiring words, I look back through the manuscript, and I don't know if I found the evidence of that philosophical um, thinking necessarily, but I did find some passages that, in my mind anyway, raise um, some interesting philosophical questions. And the one that I'd like to read, and at this time I think I'll put the glasses on so I can do it, um, I've decided to title A Question of Questioning. The sights and sounds that surround me have no apparent connection to the things that I most closely feel. Why? Memory resounds in impressions, muted, mutated, and revised adaptations that change and change again, endlessly modifying with the tick-tick-tocking away of time, and yet they remain. Why? For what reason? That I do not understand. Don't we all feel the same overwhelmed by that same simple, restless, relentless question, why? I see myself in a mirror clearly present as I am, yet different. Why? Somehow changed and yet somehow equally the same. My eyes reflected to themselves, consistently constant, yet never twice the same. Why? Unresolved, unalterable, still continually, constantly changing. Why? For what reason? Material, efficient, formal, final. Why? That single problem still remains defining final solution. Why? There are always more questions that are, than there are answers. Ultimate questions, fundamental questions, unanswerable, unanswered questions. Whither? Wherefore? Why? That question resonates and resounds unresolved and discordant, haunting time present with the looming specter of time past, echoing off into time future, constantly reverberating. Forgotten is the moment when all signification became self-referential. Forgotten. Lost in time, beyond and behind, or hidden somewhere deep below, dissolving into mere phenomenal connections. Why? Reason was, 
the nightmare from which we struggle to escape. And now, logocentrism, it said, is dead. That faculty denied all tenure, yet the sleep of reason sired monsters all the same. Why? And if you um, think about philosophical questions that relate to discontinuity and indeterminacy and the lack of meaning or significance and the total rejection of the notion of objective reality and believe that those kinds of things really are intellectual speculations that have no importance and no significance. You might want to just consider for a moment the question that was posed to Representative Gabrielle Griffith two years ago by the man who became her would-be assassin, which was, according to CNN, how can there be government when, learn, when words have lost their meaning? And we struggle with those kinds of notions, the, the almost schizophrenic ideas that have grown in a kind of postmodern world that's driven by speculations about the meaningless of language, meaninglessness of language. And that, of course, is something with which I do not agree. Um, exploring some of those themes a little further, I wanted to take some cuttings from Fall from Grace, which is a piece that is about the implications of reductionary minimalism and the defining of things more and more narrowly over time until they more or less approach the infinite vanishing point of total efficiency without reference, without illusion, stripped away of any sense of their predecessors, their origins, just things as they are within themselves. Um, and it's perceived um, by gentlemen, pictured here on the front cover, um, originally um, a role that was created by Dr. William Graham Cole, the former president of Lake Forest College and also the retired president of the Chicago Council on Foreign Relations, who in his notes about the piece described it as a powerful symbolic statement of protest, a sort of blank verse, poetic, prophetic indictment of the shallow rootlessness of current culture. Um, the character, as he's presented in the piece, is a retired Bauhaus architect who sits alone atop one of his steel and glass towers, a more or less 20th century Prometheus who has alienated everyone within his personal life, family, and friends, and now has uh, a cirrhotic liver ravished as he continues drinking scotch from a bird-shaped decanter, mm -hmm. and his only companion seems to be his answering machine, which goes off. He begins speculating about who may have called, and then his thoughts lead him in the direction of a reassessment, finally, of uh, a lifetime's work as a minimalist. Do you like back in the chat? I do. <laughs> uh, however did you know? So I decided to title at least some of the pieces tonight. So this one I, I decided should be called Urban Landscape After Dark. Dense scatter of glass-bound fires and constant flowing streams of light. Rational, utilitarian membranes of steel and glass, pragmatic units of geometric space interlaced and incandescent with endless spheres and coils and tubes burning, luminescent, filament glass fire. Harmony, rightness, the appearance of a well-tempered environment. Fearful symmetry. Not just a movement, minimalism, not just a philosophy or a school, not theorists expressing an ideal, issuing a manifesto, Success beyond that laughable degree. Virtually total success. Manifestos have become lost in time, have become foolish. The children of Pythagoras no longer are the measure of all things, and they don't even know what they have lost. 
They are specialized and recycled, trained into lives of built-in obsolescence without hope or awareness or even a shallow sense of loss. Their lives have become minimalized and their culture has become rootless and sterile. What was made within a decade has become nostalgic. Technology runs before us. The dynamo is as outdated as the virgin. Superconductors speed in the direction of E equals MC squared. And yet the intellect of Henry Adams is still to be surpassed. Anything red is esoteric. Knowledge beyond minimal employment-related awareness is elitist. And there is no interdisciplinary understanding. Connectedness is dead. And also Spake Zarathustra is the dated echo of the year 2001. Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, and Kant are all dead. But so are Luther, Calvin, and Aquinas. Marilyn Monroe lives forever. <laughs> While Simone de Beauvoir lies a moldering in the grave. Without reference, without context, without culture, science and technology create animals lost in a void of their own making. So my envisioned character um, eventually comes to a, a resolution to the crisis that he feels he's contributed to throughout his life, and it is this. Bring the museums out into the streets and recreate the images that they contain for utilitarian needs. Support Jacques Demboise with regards to Balanchine and Diaghilev so that Barishnikov can take care of himself. Paint the victory of Samothrace on racing automobiles and use the Mona Lisa to market La Giaconda condoms to women in the fight against AIDS and Leonardo's study of man to sell sunscreen against the erosion of the ozone layer. Package fast food and groceries in wrappers by Kandinsky, Clay, Mondrian, Pollock, de Kooning, and Van Gogh. Protest the nuclear threat to the existence of all this richness with signs bearing the cry by Monk and Picasso's Guernica. Popularize everything from the Venus of La Salle to Dada and Christo and anti-art. Offer the Iliad of Homer as a made-for-TV movie miniseries featuring Sylvester Stallone as Achilles and Sean Penn as his friend. Metropolis. <laughs> Gloria Steinem has the right idea. Recruit through association. Suddenly, Marilyn Monroe, Dolly Parton, and Madonna have all become feminist icons, and they bring their worshipers with them. But it worked for Christianity. Why not with human culture? Set life in its fullest context. Parade on May Day before John Lennon's tomb to the sounds of Imagine, La Sac de Pontan, and the work of Philip Glass. Universal education to the fullest limits of capacity. Beware of dogma. And enrich the mundane environment with strata upon strata of common familiarity to what is and was and may one day be. Let reductional minimalism fall from grace. 32 feet per second per second to the finite speed of light. Less is less is infinite.